Well, good morning, everyone, once again, and to those who may be listening and watching online, it's a blessing to share with you from the Word of God. And if you have God's holy and perfect preserved Word, I want you to take it and turn with me to Psalm 150, right in the middle of your Bible, Psalm 150. We're going to uh, read the whole psalm, Psalm 150. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Church, the theme for, today, for today's message, as you might well have assumed by a text, is that of praise. With the title I've given it, the power of praise. The power of of praise. I'll endeavour this morning with God's help to touch on three ways praise is powerful for the Christian. Number one, the power of praise to ward off the enemy. Number two, the power of praise to withstand in the wilderness. And number three, the power of praise to witness to the lost. We're going to look at three separate examples in scripture of men of God who prevailed powerfully through song that we also may uh, follow in their footsteps. But before, before we begin our study, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord God, and we thank you, Lord, that we can have an open Bible, Lord, that we can uh, search the Scriptures, Lord, and we know, Lord God, that they are our help. Lord, this morning I am your servant to preach your word. I am humbled. Lord God, use me as your instrument of teaching to these here, your people. And Lord... We do pray that the words that I utter, Lord God, may they be that which is sound doctrine and may they speak edification to the church. Lord, we love you here this morning. We love you and we exalt your most holy name. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, it would be remiss of me, church, while speaking on the glorious topic of praise, not to turn to the book of Psalms. And therefore, Psalm 150 is a very appropriate place to begin this morning's message. Although we do not know the human author of this psalm, we do know the true and living author, whom is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity, who summed up this fifth and final book division of the psalms so very well. and ends with a doxology and a triumphant call for all of creation to praise God. The Bible says, look down at verse 6, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. The writer cannot help but praise the Lord and lift up a shout of hallelujah to the Lord as he repeats the phrase 13 times in only six sentences. Praise him, praise him, praise him, he says. The short sentences in between conjures up the idea that he is in a hurry to utter his next hallelujah and ends with a crescendo of praise to the Most High God. And I believe we as Christians must have the same urgency and desire to praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. For he is most worthy of it. Church, praise is the occupation of the saints in heaven. And thus we should ready ourselves one day to join that glorious choir above. If you do not love seeing God's sweet praises now, you'll not be fit for God in heaven. And therefore we should, nay we must praise God while he has given us lungs to sing praises unto him. For it is but our reasonable service for the so great salvation he has given unto us. Amen. And before we see how powerful praise is, I want to quickly address three other matters. Namely, what is praise? How are we to praise? And when are we to praise? First, what is praise? Well, one such word translated in uh, the Bible, in the Hebrew, is the Old Testament word halal, which means praise, commend, celebrate, glory, sing or boast. This is where we get the word hallelujah, praise Yah, praise Jehovah. 
This can be used in the case of human, to, human interaction, as was the case of Sarai in Genesis 12, 15, where the princes of Pharaoh commended her or praised her towards Pharaoh. But more often than not, it is used in reference of praise, adoration to the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise, therefore, is singing and giving honour, Lord, blessing. It is celebrating and rejoicing in the one whom is worthy of it all. And as I mentioned before, praise is our heavenly duty while we remain on the surf and is a command from God to his saints. Praise, my friend, is when heaven and earth meet, where we enter into his presence and when we feel closest to his heavenly sanctuary. As Psalm 100 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Oh, how sweet it is, church, to sing the praises of God, to be near to Him, to be in His presence, and to thank Him and meditate on all the great things He has done for us. But just how are we to praise Him? May I suggest but a few ways in which we are to praise our great God? Firstly, by singing. Psalm 147 says, Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise unto God upon the harp. We also to praise him with music and with dancing. As Psalm 149 says, Let them praise him, his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with a timbrel and harp. We are to praise him as we've done here this morning amongst the assembly of believers. Psalm 22 says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I sing praise unto thee. We are to praise him also, church, alone on our beds at night. Psalm 149 says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. We are to praise him with lifted hands. Psalm 134 says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless his holy name. My friends, we have so many reasons to praise Jehovah. We as blood-bought saints of God must be thankful and we must, through the outflow of our hearts, then proclaim with our lips, and speak of all the great things he has done for you. We are, because of Jesus' death at Calvary and his divine grace given unto us, now adopted into his family. We are set apart for a purpose. We are no longer enemies of God, but we are now friends of God. We are now, because of his free gift of salvation, saved, forgiven, sanctified. We are now, because of his indwelling of his Holy Spirit, baptized, anointed, and empowered for service. We are now, because of his sacrifice, heaven-bound and eternally secure. What great reasons to praise our God this morning. Oh, how profitable it is to speak the praises of our King, just who he is and what he has done for us wretched sinners. Indeed, as the Psalms state, praise is comely for the upright. It is beneficial for your inner man. And the Bible says it is a good thing to praise God. May we as his saints ever delight to sing praises to him for his mighty acts and for his excellent greatness. But just when are we to praise God? Well, once again, let's consult the Psalms. Go to Psalm 113, church. Psalm 113. The Bible says in Psalm 34, while you're getting there, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Psalm 104.33 says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing while I have praises in my mouth. Psalm 71.8 says, Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honour all the day long. Look down at Psalm 113, church. Psalm 113. Verse 3. The Bible says, From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Church, we are to praise God continually, constantly, and at all times, and in every circumstance, and in all seasons, and forever. So I ask you, dear Christian, when you wake up in the morning, do you give thanks and praise to the Lord? When you go about your daily tasks, do you give thanks and praise to the Lord? And when you, when you lay your head on the pillow at night, do you give thanks and praise to the Lord? May we as saints of God never cease to be people of praise. May we ever sing to the Lord our praises 
And may we live a life cultivated and filled with endless hallelujahs to the true and living God. Amen. Now, if you notice, church, how many times the Psalms have been quoted this morning? Over and over and over again. For it is the beautiful song sheet of the saints, the perfect praise book of God. And so I implore you all as saints to read the Psalms, to live in the Psalms, to sing the Psalms, to pray the Psalms and develop a strong and deep love for them as God's glorious hymnal. And I believe and I am assured that you will grow ever closer in your walk with the Lord. You will grow ever closer to him. Now, if you have God's word, once again, I want you to take it and turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I want to change gears now and get into the meat of the message and explain how powerful praise is. For praise is a powerful thing to the Christian. I want to first note the power of praise to ward off the enemy. Just to set the scene where I had you in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we have a uh, most dire situation which has come upon King Jehoshaphat of Judah. He's been told of a great multitude of armies from the east, made up of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites, whom are coming to invade them. And King Jehoshaphat then fears, but gives his fears over to the Lord of heaven, and therefore sets a fast throughout all of Judah. Then all of Judah comes before the Lord in the temple, and Jehoshaphat prays, and he uh, seeks deliverance from the Lord. This righteous king, when in prayer, remembers Solomon's own prayer some 60-odd years earlier where he dedicated the temple that if his people were in trouble and evil would befall them, that through the sword or through pestilence or through other ways, that if they would spread forth their hands towards the temple and pray and seek the Lord, the Lord then promised to help them in their troubles and deliver them. So what happens, the Lord answers uh, their prayer uh, through a Levite. And that is where we uh, begin reading in verse 14. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 14. The Bible says, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation and said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow... Go you down against them. Before, behold, they shall come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jeriel. Ye, ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves and stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. And the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And they went forth and Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against them, and they were smitten. Jump down to verse 26, and it says, On the fourth day they assembled themselves in the valley, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakah, and for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of that place was called the valley of Barakah unto this day. Then they returned every one of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord hath made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. What an incredible deliverance we see here in the word of God by the God of Jacob. The people only had to praise God 
and the enemy was confounded and defeated. I want to now, dear church, glean some spiritual applications from this passage of Scripture that will in turn help us in our walk of faith in warding off the enemy as well. Look down at verse 15 there. The Bible says, The battle is not yours, but God's. My friend, if we first note that although we're not in a physical battle today with encroaching armies coming to overtake us, we sure are in a battle nonetheless, a spiritual battle. For the weapon of our warfare is not carnal, but mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. The Bible also says in that famous passage in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And who is the head of the spiritual army today? Satan. Satan, the adversary of God and of the believer. But just who is this enemy? You see, you'll never know, you'll never win the battle unless you study your opponent, you study your enemy. Who is he? Well, he's a created, powerful, but fallen and wicked cherub, a spiritual being, as I noted before, of the adversary of God and also of the believer. You see, what God puts forth in truth, the devil opposes in lies. He, my friend, is the great enemy, the adversary of not only God, but also of the believer in Jesus Christ. And is this truth all now expound upon? Satan, the adversary of God. Hold your place there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, but turn with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. You see, Satan has many tricks up his sleeve to inflict upon the believer in Jesus Christ. But I just want to focus on three ways in which he does. And they are through accusations, through temptations, and through deceptions. Through accusations, through temptations, and through deceptions. The devil makes accusations against the believer. And you can read of that in Revelation 12, verse 10. He goes before God with them and he says, This man is not worthy. This man is a sinner. And indeed, his accusation is true. But our Lord Jesus Christ then counters his accusation as our advocate before the Father. And he says, my shared blood has paid for his sin. Away with you, Satan. I love how the great uh, preacher Martin Luther once proclaimed famously. And he said, when Satan tells me I am a great sinner, he comforts me immeasurably. For Christ died for sinners. Praise God for our high priest this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil also makes us to fall into temptation. You can read of that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, whereby he lies in wait to set forth a stumbling block to entice the believer into sin. My friends, the scriptures proclaim that God is faithful and will always give you a way out that you may escape the temptations of the evil one. The devil also causes one to be deceived. You can read of that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. The Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed him to be the father of lies, the one whom deceiveth the whole world. But that doesn't have to be the case for the believer in Jesus Christ, as he can fight back against the lies of the devil through the sanctifying truth of the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Now, if you're there in 1 Peter chapter 5, look down at verse 8. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary... The devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom? Resist. Resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You see, church, this foe of ours is as a lion roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. He is fierce and he is indeed relentless. But how are we as saints of God to counteract the schemes of Satan? Well, of course, we know that famous passage in Ephesians chapter 6, which speaks of our warfare with Satan. I suggest you study that at another time. But this morning, I want to submit to you, it is through resisting him, through the power of praise, through proclaiming in spirit and in truth the victory of Christ, through psalms, through hymns, and in spiritual songs to the Lord. You see, just as a Jehoshaphat and the Levite singers went forth to battle with nothing but praise, we may do the same. We can win our spiritual battle 
through singing sweet melodies of praise to God, by declaring, by declaring in song the victory and the truth of Christ. And may we do that always and forever. For Satan wants to afflict upon the believer a spirit of heaviness and defeat. And we, through the victory won at Calvary, can put on, as we sung here this morning, a garment of praise to the Most High God. And therefore, silence the claims of this angry accuser, quiet the persuasion of this terrible tempter, and shut the mouth of this damnable deceiver. Look back at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, church, in verse 17. The Bible says, You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. We need to recognize in this cosmic spiritual battle of ours is that our salvation or our deliverance is not found in us fighting in the flesh, for that would be futile, for we are powerless against this great enemy. But instead our deliverance is found in resting, standing still, praising God in spirit and in truth for the victory that has already been won at the cross. You see, many Christians today are living defeated lives, are they not? They're living defeated lives, and that's exactly what Satan wants. He knows he cannot take your salvation. Therefore, he tries to steal your assurance, your joy, and your testimony for Christ. For many today have this battle around the wrong way. They feel that they have to do more. They have to give more for them to overcome the wicked one in their life. My friends, if you're in Christ, you have already had that position of victory through him and are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And it's this concept I want to emphasize this morning. The same truth that the Apostle Paul taught to the church at Ephesus, where he prayed for this church, that they would be enlightened to this great truth. Turn with me there, church, to Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 18. The Apostle Paul is praying for this church uh, at Ephesus, that they would understand this great spiritual truth. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible reads, The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. And I put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The Apostle Paul wants us, by application, church-age believers, to realize the great spiritual riches we have in Christ. He wants us to understand and put into practice the outworking of this great doctrine in our lives. And one part of these great corporal blessings in Christ is our victory over principalities and powers and over the spiritual realm. You see, we cannot stand against the devil unless we have first learnt how to sit with Christ in the heavenly places and rest in his power and the riches of the resurrected Christ, which is now ours as his body, his inheritance. And once we understand this blessing and power in Christ, we will then praise him for it in faith. Amen. Sure, Satan still may tempt you, and he will. Sure, Satan may still buffet you, and he will. Sure, Satan may still discourage you, and he will. But God has given you the power of song to proclaim the victory over the darkness. And that is yours through Jesus' cross at Calvary. Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Church, the cross was a public display and a divine emblem of Jesus' victory over sin and of Satan. The enemy thought he won a great victory, did he not, when Jesus Christ died on the cross? But my friend, a great defeat was given unto him instead. 
Our, lo our Lord, through his conquering cross, triumphed over principalities. He triumphed over powers in the demonic realm and has given us that victory to rest in, to stand in, and therefore to praise him in. We now stand in that position of victory. We proclaim the victory through praise. What a powerful standing we have, church, in Christ, having been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear Son. And thus we begin our warfare, church, not from a place of defeat, but rather from a place of utter triumph and absolute victory over the forces of evil. But my friends, do you believe this great spiritual truth here this morning? Do you believe that you have the power? You are already victorious in Christ. For Satan is a defeated foe. And when we praise God with these great spiritual truths, we will have no room for Satan's accusations. We'll have no room for Satan's lies. We'll be filled with joy through the power of the Holy Ghost. And this is why praise, my friend, is so powerful. Get your attention off Satan's lies, off Satan's schemes, and onto, onto the conquering cross of the Christ of God, who has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that we, we may, as did the Apostle Paul, glory only in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look back at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, church, we can also note these men of God praise God before, during, and after the battle. And thus should our, be our way of praise as well. We often get discouraged and we feel as though the battle's not going our way. And that is the enemy's best tactic to get, to get us discouraged from believing the promises of God. But what was Jehoshaphat's response when hearing this prophetic answer of prayer from Jehaziel? Well, look down at verse 20. Verse 20 says, Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets so shall you prosper. Dear congregation, praise is an act of faith in proclaiming God's precious promises even when we cannot feel them or see them. We must therefore to be established in this spiritual battle if we are to prosper in this warfare of ours using faith, the weapon of praise to the Lord, even when you cannot see the victory in sight. King Jehoshaphat did not walk by sight, but rather he walked by faith. In proclaiming to the Lord Jesus Christ, he would proclaim to the Lord and send forth to the front line of the battle the appointed singers of the Korites and the uh, tribe of Levi. He sent them forth. He didn't send the battlers forth. He sent the singers forth. And they sung and they proclaimed, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And thus should be our song as well. As soon as they sung praises in faith, the Lord confounded the Moabites, the Ammonites, and those of Mount Seir. And I believe, church, he will do the same in your fight against the enemy. As you look in faith to the cross, and know the battle is not yours but the Lord's, praise shall fill your soul, and praise shall be your weapon to overcome the wicked one. So I'll ask you some questions this morning. Is the enemy causing you to lose faith? Then proclaim in song, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Is the enemy attacking you with thoughts of insufficiency? Then sing the hymn, Jesus all sufficient. Is the enemy afflicting you with ill health? Then proclaim in song the truth of Psalm 91. Is the enemy uh, setting an ambush of doubt against your soul? Then sing the hymn, faith is the victory. For therein church lies the power to overcome the wicked one and to win this warfare of ours by singing joyfully the victory of Christ which, as I said earlier, gets your mind off your circumstance and onto Christ and his conquering cross all through praise. The weapon of praise is mighty, as we've seen this morning, to ward off the enemy. As the famous hymn which we sung earlier, Onward Christian Soldiers, states, listen carefully to the lyrics. At the name of Jesus, Satan's host doth flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver, at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. Amen. But not only, church, do we note in Scripture the power of praise to ward off the enemy, we also see the power of praise to withstand in the spiritual wilderness. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 2, church. The book of Jonah. Chapter 2, we're going to look at the story of the prophet of Jonah. 
Now, although Jonah was not in a spirit, he was not in a physical wilderness, but rather he was in the depths of the sea, he sure was in a spiritual wilderness, destitute in despair. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the story of Jonah, who was commissioned to preach repentance unto, uh, unto Nineveh. But instead, he famously ran from God, from God's calling in his life, and tried to flee to Tarshish, the opposite direction from whence he was to go. Now, note how often it is in our own spiritual walk of faith that we are just like Jonah, are we not? When the Lord has given you a task to do, he's given you a specific assignment, however great or however small that may be, Often we too, just like Jonah, run in the other direction. We therefore, church, must heed the story and lesson of Jonah and obey God's calling in our lives. For if God the Holy Spirit and his still small voice has told you to do something, you do it. You do it in obeying the Lord. You do it in faith through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. This is what the book of Jonah is all about. Now, while Jonah is on the uh, ship to Tarshish, he then uh, uh, arrives at a great tempest and he implores his sailors to throw him overboard. For only then, he says, will the tempest be stayed. As it happened, they indeed throw him overboard and the storm uh, stops. And that's where we pick up the narrative in Jonah chapter 2. We find Jonah in the middle of the whale. Look down at verse 1, church. The Bible says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell, or Sheol, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then said I, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even unto the soul. The the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that forsake lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Note the incredible situation the Lord has his prophet Jonah. The waters have compassed him about, seaweed was wrapped around his head, and he sinks to the depth of the ocean. Often, church, it takes such incredible situations in your life for you to understand the loving kindness and mercy of the Lord, to be able to comprehend the chastening love of the Father, which leads one to repentance. And this sure was Jonah's experience here. But just what was his response to this incredible situation? What was his prayer unto Jehovah? Well, he offers not only up a prayer, but a psalm of thanksgiving unto the Lord. For praise can not only be sung unto the Lord, but also it can be uttered as a prayer, as a psalm of thanksgiving. This was the case of Jonah. Look down at verse 6, church, where he says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet has there brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. I note that although Jonah is in the middle of the whale's belly, he cries out such word in praise and in faith and says, Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. This, of course, signifies a greater truth than that of praise, church, in that it signifies and pictures the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This prophetically foreshadowed the gospel of Jesus, our, Jesus Christ our Lord. And, this, and Jesus said so much in the gospel accounts, where he said in Matthew 12, 39, he says, when rebuking the unbelieving and sign-seeking Pharisees, he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, And there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Elsewhere in Psalms, we see King David also speaking about the Lord Jesus and his death, burial and resurrection. For indeed, all of Scripture points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is no different where we have in Psalm 16, where King David specifically 
and prophetically proclaims the gospel truth. And he says, For thou will not leave my soul in hell, or Sheol, for thou will not leave, suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou will show me the path of life, and in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Indeed, just as our Lord Jesus Christ and his body was not left in Sheol, his body did not suffer to see corruption, so too was the case for the prophet Jonah, as he in praise, even before the deliverance was accomplished, uttered forth the Lord's praise in thanksgiving and in faith. Only then was he delivered from the depths of the sea and of the belly of the fish. Look down at verse 9, church, where the Bible says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Notice, church, the word sacrifice. The prophet Jonah, though in the dark depths of the sea, with seaweed wrapped around his head, surely in fear, he then sets in his heart to offer up to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. This is a sacrifice of praise that our Lord is well pleased with, as he then delivers Jonah from the belly of the fish and returns him to dry land. This is the concept of the sacrifice of praise as shown elsewhere in Scripture. So I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 13. Uh, while you're getting there, I want to read a couple other scriptures from the Psalms. So you're going to uh, Hebrews 13, but I'm going to read from Psalm 107, which says, Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And again in Psalm 116, verse 17, it says, I will offer unto thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Our Lord loves hearing the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving which comes to him from his saints, especially when everything else, every other situation tells them to do otherwise. This, my friends, is a sacrifice of praise the Lord is well pleased with. Look down at Hebrews 13, church, at verse 15, where the Bible says, By him, that is by Jesus, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You see, church, because of our great uh, and superior high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now part of the royal priesthood. And as such, we can offer up to God spiritual sacrifices to him. Although we do not offer up physical sacrifices, as was the case in the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, we now, because of our great and superior high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, can now through him, through our high priest, offer up to God spiritual sacrifices of praise. By lifting up our hands unto the Father and by our lips, giving thanks to his holy name. And indeed, this is well pleasing to him. A sacrifice of praise, church, is best when it costs us the most. A sacrifice of praise is best when it costs us the most. For indeed, it's easy to praise God when upon the mountaintop, but not so in the valley. It is easy to praise God when safe upon dry land, but not so when in the depths of the sea. But my friend, may I suggest to you this morning that it is most profitable to you to sing praise to God in the valley. It is most profitable for you to sing praise to God in the depths of the sea. For therein lies the sacrifice of praise that God is well pleased with. And thus, this is demonstrated in our text in Jonah. For in offering up a sacrifice of praise, we lift our eyes off our situation, off our feelings, instead setting them upon the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therein lies the power of praise to withstand in the spiritual wilderness. For when we take our eyes off Jesus Christ, no matter our circumstance, our soul will be filled with our situation and our troubled emotions. But when we in faith offer up to God in our spiritual wilderness a sacrifice of praise, our souls will be filled with his joy, with his love, with his mercy, and with his praise. And you will be delivered from your wilderness and translated into his presence with fullness of joy. I think the great English reformer and martyr for Christ, John Bradford, said it best when he stated, O oh my soul, lift up thyself above thyself. Fly away in the contemplation of heaven and heavenly things. Make not thy abode in this inferior region, 
where there is nothing but travail and trials and sorrow and woe and wretchedness and sin and trouble and fear and all deceiving and destroying vanities. Bend all thine affection upward unto the superior places where thy Redeemer liveth and reigneth, where thy joys are laid up in the treasury of his merits, which shall be thy merits. His perfection, thy perfection. His death, thy eternal life, and his resurrection, thy salvation. So we're seeing this morning, church, the power of praise to ward off the enemy, the power of praise to withstand in the wilderness, and finally, we're going to see in Scripture the power of praise to witness to the lost. Turn with me, church, to Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts chapter 16. And um, just some background information to where we have find ourselves in the Word of God. We note that the Apostle Paul and his companion in the Gospel, uh, Silas, are in the middle of their second missionary journey. And uh, they, after reaching Troas of Asia, the great Apostle Paul has a vision of a Macedonian man pleading and praying for him to come over to the region of Macedonia uh, to help him there. So then, they then, of course, obey the call of the vision to preach the Gospel in that area, and they venture over to uh, Philippi of Macedonia. Now, after some days, they find themselves um, preaching the gospel, and they find themselves rebuking an unclean spirit of a slave girl who is involved in uh, divination for her master. And because of this, they find themselves before the city's magistrate. And uh, that's where we pick up the narrative in the story. So Acts chapter 16, look down at verse 20. The Bible reads, And brought them to the magistrates, saying, these men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the great multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. I want to stop there for a moment and meditate on that verse. They sung praises to God. Imagine the scene. The apostle Paul and Silas have just been falsely accused. They've been beaten with many stripes. They are bloody, battered and bruised. They're thrown into the inner prison. Now their feet fasted tightly with stocks, with guards uh, watching them intently. And yet at midnight, instead of sleeping it off, instead of complaining, instead of grumbling about the situation, what do we see them doing? Singing praises to God, offering up to God a song in the night. The great preacher, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon once said, It is easy to sing when we can read the, the notes by daylight, but the skillful stages, he who can sing, where there is not a ray of light to read by. Songs in the night, he says, come, not, come only from God. They don't come in the power of men. Just how is this possible though? How can a person have such reassurance and praise and peace in the midst of such a dark and fiery trial? Well, it's as Spurgeon said, not through the strength of man, but rather through the power of the comforter with them, the Holy Ghost. It was the third person of the Trinity which gave them such a song in the night. It was the Comforter which gave them such blessed assurance in the midst of that Philippian jail. Jesus Christ said when he ascended unto the Father that he would give us such a helper, a mentor, a teacher who would aid us in our time of need. He says in John 14 verse 16 in his famous discourse about the Holy Spirit, he says, I'll pray the Father and he shall give you another Comforter that may he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth and the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knows him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and later he shall be in you. He goes on to say, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. My friends, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Saviour by faith only in his cross of Calvary, I've got some good news. You have this same comforter, living inside of you. Amen. Amen. And he shall abide with you forever. Ephesians 1.13 says, Once we uh, hear the word of the gospel, 
Once we believe, we are then sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, whom is the earnest of our inheritance unto the praise of his glory. You see, he will be with you forever. He shall never leave you, as was the case in the Old Testament saints, but he will be with you and assure your salvation till we see Jesus Christ at the rapture. Amen. What a blessing, what a resource we have as Christians. The Spirit of Christ dwelling within us, taking up residence in our hearts. But just what is his ministry? He has many ministries. I want to touch on just two. To give peace and to sing praises to God. To give peace and to give praise to God. Jesus said again in the same chapter about the giving of the Holy Spirit. He says, Peace I give with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. My friend, peace is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. His ministry, my friends, is peace, supernatural peace. Supernatural peace. Such peace as we see here in Acts chapter 16 that Paul and Silas had, and it can be yours today. Not the fleeting peace which the world offers, but the supernatural peace and comfort through the everlasting God himself, the Holy Spirit. No matter the circumstance you may be facing, that may be illness, his peace will be there. Whether it's job loss, his peace shall be there. Whether it be persecution, his peace shall be there. Whether it be suffering of all and any kinds, his peace promises to be there. But, my friend, it's only if we are in fellowship with his Son and we are filled with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So the application is for us, church-age believers, to be in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ daily and be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. We also note, church, of the Spirit's ministry to testify of and to praise God, to testify of and praise God. In John 15, 26, Jesus Christ says, When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Again, in the same discourse to his disciples, he goes on to explain that the Holy Spirit shall glorify Jesus Christ. He shall glorify and speak of Jesus Christ. He shall not speak of his own, but he only speak that which he hears from the Father. We also note, dear church, of the Spirit's, uh, Spirit's power to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit's job to speak of, to glorify Christ. And thus we see this example in Acts 16. It was the Spirit of work which led these two great missionaries of God to sing forth God's praises at night. And I want to note they were living, breathing examples of Ephesians 5.18, which says, Be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in what? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Giving thanks for all things unto the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a witness this must have been to those around them, to those hearing the song of rejoicing. But for instead of being filled with despair, discouragement or despondency, they were filled with gratitude, gratefulness and glory by the Holy Ghost. May we as saints of God follow their example and sing praises in the night. But look down once again, church, at our passage. Uh, we, we, we note the miraculous events which follow. Verses 26, we're going to begin reading. And it says in verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the, of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors were open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he came, called for a light, and, and sprang in and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. And brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And they took him the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And he was baptized, he and all his house, straightway. And when they had brought him into his house, he set meat before them, rejoicing, believing in God with all his house. We see here, church, the, through the praises of Paul and Silas, an incredible witness 
to the Philippian jailer. The walls of prison could not contain their praise to God and therefore could not contain the gospel message. It is this witness of praise that led this uh, pagan Roman jailer to be saved. Not only he, church, but his whole house, his whole family. My friends, it was praise to God that began that supernatural earthquake. It was praise to God that, br- that broke that prisoner's shackles. It was praise to God that led that jailer to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It was in the darkest of circumstances that the opportunity of a praiseworthy attitude shone forth the light of Christ. And thus we see its power to witness to the lost. For those around these great men of God must have been wondering, how can you be singing praises to God in such a situation? How can you be filled with such a praiseworthy attitude in such trying times? This church is a great witness to the lost. For they not have a rock as we have to turn to. For when we are in dire straits, and when we come to rock bottom, as Pastor Dean often says, we come to the rock of ages, amen, whom we can stand on and hold us up to sing supernatural praises to God in the night. If I can but speak for experience for just a moment. When I myself was in hospital some years ago, I was battling mental anguish. I was battling mental anguish and suffering from both demons and from the flesh. The Lord too gave me a midnight song in Psalm 40. He gave me this psalm to sing in praise as a witness to those around me of the power of God and the power of praise. It reads, I waited patiently for the Lord And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of an horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. Many shall see the praise of God and shall fear and come to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. They say, I want that praise. I want that peace. I want that power. My friends, how can you be filled with such praise to God? Well, it's not in the power of men, as we've noted, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, which gives us such songs in the night and therefore are a witness to others of Jesus Christ and his glorious gospel. So we note here the power of praise to the witness to the lost in Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas sung praise to God and shook the foundations of that prison and gave them such an incredible opportunity to win souls for Christ. Paul must have took up his own advice, the advice he wrote some 10 years later when he established this church at Philippi. And what did he write? He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. It was this attitude of gratitude. It was this praiseworthy mindset of both Paul and Silas which led to the salvation of others. It was their song of the night which sparked an interest in Christ in these pagan jailers and is the same today. It is the peace, praise and power in which the world finds different and attractive for they themselves do not have such divine graces. May we then, like these two great men of God, sing continuous hallelujahs to the Lord. For by doing so, we shall bring glory to God and bring lost souls to the Saviour. So church, my final exhortation for this morning is this. Be a person of praise. Do not neglect such a spiritual and heavenly exercise. Cultivate a life filled with praise to God. And as a result, you shall find that you shall defeat that dreaded foe. You shall strengthen and build up your inner man. And you shall bring lost souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. All through the power of praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning to get an insight into this topic of praise. And as we've noted, it is a powerful thing to sing your praises, O Lord. Help us as your people, Lord God, to be continually filled with your praise, continually be filled with your Holy Spirit. Often, Lord, this this world, the flesh, the devil wants to take us off our minds, take our minds off uh, the glorious victory, which is ours in Christ Jesus. Uh, He wants to put forth uh, a stumbling block wants to put forth these, these battles. But Lord God, as we've seen here this morning with King Jehoshaphat, the battle's not ours, but it's yours. And so why, may we, O oh Lord, be a person, be a people of praise. May we be a people of praise, Lord God, that when other people may see us, 
They may see the risen Christ in us. And they may say, I want that. I want that. Lord, help us to be your people filled with praise because you are most worthy of it. And so we, we, we speak forth your praise here this morning. We speak forth your majesty, your glory, your honour, uh, all of these divine attributes which are yours. We praise you for them. And we thank you, Lord God. May this message uh, edify uh, your saints and those who are listening. We love you, Lord. We praise you and honour you in Jesus' almighty name. Amen.